clinicians. This is Ali Nasse, and I'm joined today by our faculty, Dr. Uh, John Gaddy. John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely terrific. So let's do a case review here uh, with a molar and actually a couple of molars. This is a patient that came to you with a chief complaint of pain in the lower right side. Yeah, so she had, what happened? Tell us. Well, she had an acute uh, a pain, on the more acute on, on uh, number 31, but uh, to percussion, uh, 30 was also uh, uh, sensitive as well. Yeah. So basically, based on the emergency part of it, the acute symptoms were coming from 31, which is your second molar, and your chronic symptoms were coming from the first molar that had a previous root canal, and it was previously it retreated it was as well. Correct. So it was retreated originally, and it didn't seem to uh, um, address the symptoms. It looks like on the mesial root, in this particular angle that separates the two roots uh, adequately, it shows that there might be some kind of a finning going on, a little bit of an isthmus or something like that. So um, that's been uh, prepared. So the first thing you do, obviously, in an emergency case is to address the, took care the main uh, yes. symptoms, which means you access through the crown and did the root canal. Anything remarkable here? Uh, what we see uh, up in the frication, we have uh, our frication canal. Yeah. You get a little furcal canal popping there with the biceramic sealer. And that is, um, um, uh, you were telling me that there was some probing going on preoperatively. There, and there was. That was a fear that uh, there's a fracture there or something like that. So you get a lot of these furcal canals that cause these uh, narrow sulcular uh, type of um, uh, fistulas or sinus tracts that could be goes mistaken. Right through the frication. It goes through the frication yes. and it gets mistaken for a crack or a fracture right. and end up uh, losing the tooth. And fortunately, yeah. on this case, we had a CBCT and I didn't see any fracture on that. So okay. it confirmed when we filled the tooth that yeah. we, were, we were able to see the sealer. Yeah, exactly. Of course, uh, you know, CBCTs give us an uh, indication and a few more percentage points to find a crack compared to the regular radiographs. But of course, they are not definitive in yes. terms of uh, finding, uh, you know, extra, uh, finding fractures, vertical fractures, and things like that. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, John, here is that this tooth shows that it's sitting right on top of the infraviolar nerve. It does. It, the, this uh, PA is a little foreshortened, so right. when we look at the uh, CBCT, you're going to see, and then we've, we've made a little diagram of the nerve, and you'll see that there is quite a bit of distance between the nerve and the yeah. actual end of the root. So this is the CBCT prior to the tracing, and what's actually interesting is that you have a couple of really nice angles of the second molar, where you just treated using hydraulic condensation with a single cone, with a single cone yeah. and it shows how beautifully, uh, you know, it fills that the webbing that is going on in this tooth with the biceramic sealer and the just the, the one cone. So that's with, actually with very nice. very few voids. Yeah, very few, exactly. Yeah. So that shows that you're, um, you're implementing the hydraulic condensation exactly properly the way it should be. Also, you can see from here that there is a good amount of distance between the um, the apex of this tooth and the infraviolar nerve. Yes. Whereas on the periapical, it looked like it was right it's on top close. of it. Which is, again, another important point about the, the parallel uh, quality of your um, periapicals in terms of their diagnostic uh, capability. If sometimes if you foreshorten, for lengthen them, then you can end up uh, giving you a look that is uh, more menacing. But here, having the ability to take a CBCT is great because you were going to do the apical next, I guess, on the first molar. Which we needed the CBCT for the apical, absolutely. Yeah, and the CBCT shows that you have fairly good distance there, and it tells you exactly what's going on. And so this is the tooth, and then what do you do next? This is the uh, surgical access of, uh, of the tooth, and, and here we used a probe just to kind of verify what we see radiographically and to kind of orient ourselves with where we're going to make our osteotomy, the initial osteotomy. Uh, there's, a, there's a fair amount, and we saw this on the CBT as well, uh, there's a fair amount of bone thickness from buckle to uh, the lesion, which is about four or five millimeters. Yeah, it's really critical in order to have uh, fairly um, small or as minimally invasive as possible of an osteotomy so you can access directly the end of the root to get yourself three-dimensionally oriented to where the end of the root would be and where your apicoectomy would be done. So having information prior hands and then sometimes using something as simple as a perioprobe to transfer that information of length from the point of the apex of the crown, so the margins of the crown to the tip of the root, how many millimeters it is that you could use easily digitally 
measure that and transfer that with the right orientation using a probe so you know exactly Abs where that absolutely. is. Absolutely, and that's what we did, and that's why we used the probe, because we had the measurement on the CBCT, and we brought it to the field, and we also have the orientation. Because, exactly. Because in the molar region, sometimes you don't get the buccal ridges of, for root orientation that you do yeah. maybe in the maxilla. Absolutely. When, when it's too thick, you don't see the bulge of the root uh, quite the same way as you would see in a tooth where you have a uh, thin buccal shelf. Uh, also to be careful also in terms of the divergence of the roots as well as curvatures, you could end up having the tip of the root being completely a different place than the trunk uh, and the cervical part of the root. So these types of ideas are important in three-dimensionally orienting yourself. One of the other tricks that I uh, oftentimes use in a case like this where you have fairly thick buccal bone and you're totally disoriented, at any point during the, um, um, the osteotomy, I just take a little ball of the putty material, place it directly into the area where my burr is, Great idea. and take an x-ray, yeah. and I quickly see where I am in relation to the root end, and I will make adjustments. The same way you can use the BC sealer in calcified cases and inject it into the axis preparation and then take an x-ray. Uh, you could do the same thing with the putty during the surgery uh, or even the sealer, but the putty Putty's stays a little bit better. Stay, yeah, good. so it doesn't yeah. smear around. So that's a, and then it easily comes out. Uh, so that's a great, so, so at this point you've done your uh, osteotomy and you can see beautifully and very conservatively you managed to find both of the apices and uh, you're now using here the section technique. Correct. Yeah, we, right? we want to do that because I want to see if I can get the apex of the tooth out in total. So mm -hmm. I know that I have everything resected and get the granulo granulo granulation tissue um, taken Completely out. Completely out. Yes. So for those, uh, of, for those viewers who don't know the difference, there's generally basically a couple of different techniques to do the apicoectomy at this point. One is a section technique and the grinding technique. And the grinding technique, you basically isolate, go all the way down to the apex apex of the tooth, and then you grind all the way up. In the section technique, you actually make a cut straight across at three millimeters, and then you remove the apical, the apical segment. Uh, the apical segment, uh, the section technique, I think, find it pretty good also and helpful in situations in which you have, you're close to vital tooth structures or vital nerve. anatomical structures, such as infiavial nerve, and this way you don't have to go all the way down and you save yourself a little bit of uh, space on the osteotomy side. And, so, no, and note on this too, when we get to the uh, post-op x-ray, we have a fair amount of bone uh, from the furcation down to the uh, osteotomy and the root resection. And, and uh, we'll make a comment on the radiograph because it looks, uh, on the radiograph it's a little foreshortened, but we yeah. can tell that we have, uh, we're pretty, pretty uh, fair amount of bone on the buckle. Yeah, that's, that's that's true. So here it shows one of the benefits also of doing this section technique, correct? Yes. What is the benefit of it? Well, the benefit is, is here, and it's a beautiful picture that shows that we can see our resection, and then we can see uh, if we have the entire tip of the root in total. Yeah. So again, too, for those of you who are not familiar with this technique, what you're looking at right now is the cut portion of the apical three millimeter of the root. So John here is basically backing out the root tip and he gets to view the other side, which would be kind of like the, you know, the continuation. Section. Yeah, so basically this is the end of the root. From, it's the coronal aspect of the apex that is now being removed and uh, it's a higher magnification here. And what, you, what, what it shows you is what you have on the opposite side. Right? Sometimes it's very difficult to look at the opposite side. You have to use mirrors, retro so mirrors, micro mirrors, micro mirrors yes. to look up the root. Right. But you can actually cheat and look at the opposite yeah, side, which is the view. part that you're taking out. It's a good view. And you get a, a, a better understanding. And here you can see the isthmus, you can see the uh, area of discoloration, which shows the bacterial contamination around the gutta percha and the reason why this tooth uh, had failed. And you can see in this fill. Um, it's really not a three-dimensional fill, you, yeah. can, you can tell. Exactly. Uh, it hadn't uh, uh, quite um, uh, adhered to the canal walls here. So um, this is now in the mesial area. It looks like you're just removing the granulation tissue. Yeah, and, and this was actually uh, more apical once the tip was removed. So you want to, that's another critical thing when, when you're doing apical surgery. You want to make sure you get that, that crevice completely cleaned out of all mm -hmm. the granulation tissue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, trying to clean it out uh, as much as possible is, is a great idea. Of course, I personally don't cure it the whole thing out all the time um, because usually I, I kind of look at it as long as there's no foreign body in there, as long as we take care of the uh, 
uh, the source of the problem, which is inside the roots, then that area should heal on its own. But it's, it's a better, you know, it helps the healing much faster when you do try to remove as much of it as possible. So here, what, do, what are we looking at? Well, and you're here, this is what you commented before, we see our isthmus, that, and that was more than likely the issue that we had why uh, the tooth had been failing. Exactly. And it looks like you got in there and you prepared it, and then you filled it with a BC putty and the, the sealer with technique. the lid technique. Yes. And here now you put on some uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone over it. Yes. Correct? And that, yes, and then we place a membrane over there, a uh, resorbable membrane as well. Yeah, so just going to cover it. And then uh, you close it up, and uh, the tooth, uh, this tooth is now kind of healed. This is the final fail. Again, it's foreshortened. I don't think you didn't cut the root really that right, short. Right, that's why I wanted to make yeah. the comment of the bone when you saw yeah. the osteotomy, but it's yeah. not as it's not as short as that. But yeah, uh, exactly. So yeah, some patients, very patients well. yeah, some patients is tough. To, you know, in the back of the mouth to take the the, the X-ray in the right uh, direction and so on. So. That this this tooth is healed very nicely and uh, is doing well. I'm doing sure. Doing very well. Yeah, patient's doing great. Absolutely. So one other thing I wanted to talk to you about is the um, idea of using demineralized freeze dried bone and membranes. Do you use it uh, all all the time? Do you use it sometimes? Because I'm not. A, I don't use it that much. Only if it's coronal and I have. Yeah, I need to do GBR. I I, I use it uh, mainly when we saw the case where we had the furcation involvement. But I I do try to routinely do these types of cases with mm -hmm. adding the bone. I feel like we get a faster little, healing. little bit more healing, yes, yeah. a little faster. Definitely, do the, uh, you would, having that osteoconduction on that membrane will help uh, heal things a little bit faster right. uh, in that sense. Well, terrific. This was, I think, is a very educational case, and thank you so much for sharing it with our audience. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. But we will then know. I'm Ali Nisse, John Gatti, and we hope you found this information helpful.